Hi, I'm Danny Glover, and I'd like to briefly talk to you about one of the most successful programs in the state of California, the Educational Opportunity Program. During the past 30 years, over 250,000 students have entered and graduated from California State Universities with the help of EOP. EOP will continue to provide access to higher education. Hey, everyone has a shot at this opportunity, so prove me wrong and call the number on your screen. EOP's doors are open now. That's right, we're bapping out the hits for you on this gorgeous Monday morning. It's going to be another hot one, so you people heading out to work or school, be sure to dress cool. This should cool you off just thinking about those boys at the beach. Of course, the Beach Boys. This one's for Mary and Eddie, a couple of lovebirds, starting the first day back to school at San Fernando Valley State College. <laughs> Get to class, you crazy kids. In my head. I come in late at night in the morning. Today, South Vietnam, heavy casualties reported in renewed fighting. On the home front, civil rights leader Martin Luther King led marches in rural Mississippi. For the times, they are changing. Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down There was a mood on campus uh, in the late 1960s that was of an extraordinary nature. Uh, I think that a good many of us uh, felt that it was uh, rather incumbent upon us to rebel. What it means was to not accept uh, uh, things as they were and to at least investigate them, if not to change them. I think most of us came to school uh, most of us who were involved in any way came to school every day expecting something to happen. I can remember always having uh, a spare dime in my pocket and uh, the telephone number of a lawyer written in indelible ink on, my, on the palm of my hand because I didn't know if I'd get arrested when I came into school or not. Students basically were questioning the Vietnam War, race relations in this society, more broadly the whole nature of the society lingering aspects of Victorian sexual mores, uh, politics and political behavior, questioning Democrats, questioning Republicans. But this was an era when just turning on a television set, one could flip from Leave It to Beaver to men landing on the moon to piles of bodies in Vietnam. It was a terribly confused and complex time. The thing that made it most complex and most confusing and most dangerous, particularly the young people who might have to fight it, was the Vietnam War. Vietnam changed everything about the 1960s. Uh, the war in Vietnam always loomed in the background, and not so much even in the background, but in the forefront as well. Many of our students uh, were faced with the direct threat of being drafted and being sent to uh, a fight in a war that was uh, growing increasingly unpopular. Uh, you always keep in mind the perspective of what was happening nationally. Uh, the Selma, Alabama thing, uh, the, the, the beatings of blacks and, and civil rights activists in Mississippi, the assassinations, uh, the, the assassination especially of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy coming within 
a very short time with each other. Uh, this galvanized uh, the campus. As that occurred, of course, um, there were more and more students began to get active and attempt to get people active on this campus, and more and more did become active. And as they did, it began to affect their lives everywhere on, uh, on campus. There were meetings. There were people talking, haranguing, standing up here and there. One of my early recollections of getting involved by a student here at Valley State College was, a, was the movement around the Civil Rights Movement in the South. And many of us were involved in uh, solidarity movements of getting food and sending money down south to the struggle around King and his movement. And a lot of us were affected deeply by that. At the end of my first semester teaching at Northridge, I received among my finals a blue book from a student who was very marginal in the course. He might pass, he might fail. And on the last page of that final, I found the plea, please don't pluck me. If you do, they'll send me to Vietnam. In 66 and 67 on this campus, uh, uh, SDS had been formed and we were doing educational work around the draft and around the lack of student deferments. This is where it all really began. This is where the whole shot rang out. And we began to build a, a anti-war sentiment on this campus and an anti-draft sentiment on this campus. And our SDS was a multi-issue group, it didn't just, uh, a multi-issue organization. It didn't just deal with uh, the war and things abroad, but we were involved with a campus coalition dealing with equal opportunity programs for minorities and uh, poor students. And one of the things that, that surprised me, really astonished me when I came here, was the fact that the campus was virtually lily white. The year before I arrived, there were 23 black students at North Ridge, and there were seven Mexican Americans. Valley State had a reputation of being a white citadel. Uh, Minority people came to uh, Valley State to deliver services and then leave. Uh, it had the reputation of being an extremely racist institution and that minority students shouldn't even think of matriculating here. I think the attitudes of faculty members on this campus towards minority students, particularly towards blacks and Chicanos in the late 60s, uh, range. That is, uh, there was a wide range of reactions. I know on the basis of some of the anonymous notes I got when I became a, sort of a, a figure in this, that there was, uh, there was, a, there was a, there's racism, out and out, simple, straightforward racism um, from faculty members. To be a change agent, which is how I define myself, uh, and my mission coming here was to change. So I had an academic obligation and responsibility, but I also had a social commitment. That whole question around black brought forth images of great fear, apparently, in white folk. So when it became very necessary to organize a black student union here on the campus, went to the uh, Associated Students Office, and I told them I would like to organize a group of students on campus and I told him I wanted to organize a black student union. And it was like, uh, what? And in fact, when the black student union chartered itself, some of the SDS people had to sign the charter because there wasn't even enough names to meet the school's requirement. We were involved with the black student union and Metro around getting funding for uh, equal opportunity programs for the campus. The, the window doors of opportunity weren't there. There was no way to get into the system. Uh, and we were politically sophisticated enough to know that someone and people in certain positions were holding those doors and windows of opportunity closed to the American dream. Our position was, I am an American. My people have been here, labored, 400 plus years, and you mean to tell me you won't give me equal access to an education? I think again in the 1960s we started to see ourselves as part of uh, groups of people in this country who had felt uh, left out, 
all throughout 67 and early 68 spring we had lobbied with the student organizations to try to get money to in effect form scholarships and the largest block of money found for scholarships uh, to bring uh, minority students on this campus was voted through our lobbying through the student government and even the administration didn't match the students uh, money that they put into uh, into the program here so by 68 remember November of 68 was the was the fall semester the second semester of that year uh, we had about oh probably 130 to 150 black students and anywhere from 50 to 75 Chicano students on the campus at that time who'd been recruited by students in the summer of 68 moving into the fall of, of, of 68 uh, a number of promises made by the administration were broken and in fact it looked as if we were going to be moving backwards in regards to opening up the campus to minorities my recollections of, of november 4th uh, are well my my recollections are a little confused uh, they're confused because the day was very confusing what I remember, what I remember quite vividly, is suddenly the fourth floor of the administration building. We had, the, the the news swept through the campus. The fourth floor of the administration building had been occupied by a number of black students, and that presumably certain administrators had been ta taken hostage. Uh, and I remember very vividly a, a very very huge crowd standing in front of the administration building and a discussion there with the hostage acting president and some of the blacks over what had, what had happened. Uh, now, my, my, as I say, my recollections, I know now, I mean, I, I, I can't remember just when I discovered that I know, I know what had happened in a general way uh, on November 4th, that the black students had been trying to deal with what they perceived as a, as a case of racism among the coaching staff. There was a, a freshman football game and we had some black students that were playing. And one of the students, something happened on the field. And one of the assistant coaches or something literally kicked this young man in his behind. Literally kicked him in his behind on the field in front of his teammates and spectators. Uh, an altercation, small altercation ensued, but it was cooled out and it was decided that a meeting had to be held with the athletic director. Once organized, the Black Student Union became the uh, ombudsman, if you will, for the protests, the complaints of various minority students. When a student would make an allegation of some uh, act of prejudice or discrimination, then the Black Student Union would then follow this up. And a meeting was called for that following morning and at that meeting, uh, this gentleman had a very, very nasty, nasty attitude. He was very condescending. Uh, he had an attitude, who the hell are you to think that you can come and demand something from me? Do you know who I am? Uh, and he had to be rudely awakened that he was not dealing with the Negro student who walked around this campus very passively, but he was dealing with a new student, a black student, who were about change. They were told there that the, the, the that administrator told them that, they, that he could not deal with them, or deal with the issue, that it was a matter for the president, presumably, whereupon the black students surrounded uh, this person and said, well, then apparently that we'll, we'll go to the administration building then and see the appropriate administrator. Uh, the, 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 they, they'd apparently felt that that was simply the last straw. They had been, they had been buffeted from here to there and told to go here and told to go there, and finally uh, they, they blew. What happened was students left the PE building, went to the administration building, along with a couple of the staff members from the PE department to meet with the uh, uh, president of the campus here to carry forth these allegations of racism and prejudice. When they arrived at the uh, administration building, they were told that the president was not on campus and therefore he would not be able to see them. 
because we had been given the runaround like this on any number of occasions, the students just simply said, well, if he's not on campus, we will wait until he comes back. And we won't wait alone, we will all wait together. As it turns out, he was on campus, as the students had uh, suspected. He was brought to the room, and when he was brought there, a number of demands, if you will, were laid before him, including, uh, number one, the investigation of this coach who, uh, who had uh, committed this act of uh, discrimination, as well as a number of other things, but most notably, the expansion of the EOP program, the creation of ethnic studies programs, the recruiting of minority teachers on this campus, and an investigation of the hiring practices of the campus. We learned about this while we were at a rally, we meaning the Students for Democratic Society. We were rallying against the war at that time because the elections were taking place. And we were, we were told that they had done this since we had been part of the coalition around these fundings, we thought it was incumbent to support this action. It was a nonviolent uh, takeover of the administration building. And at that point, we cut off our rally. We called people from who were in classes in various areas. And we went over, and we nonviolently sat in on the first floor on the steps, not blocking anybody, in solidarity. We were all shocked, um, because the first stories that came out was that uh, one of our faculty had been kidnapped by, or several of our faculty had been kidnapped uh, by student activists, uh, that one had actually had a knife held at his throat, uh, that a number of uh, women secretaries were harassed, locked into a room, uh, held against their will, and things of that sort. To this very day, I don't know how much of that is true. Uh, there were just too many uh, stories and rumors. What you had was a campus that had a core of people, maybe 100, 150 by that time, which was growth from the earlier years, uh, plus the black and Chicano students, who were beginning to be pretty consciously aware of what racism meant. But you had a large group of students who really didn't understand what was happening, and their first response was hostility. We, in effect, took the responsibility of educating white students and by taking that responsibility obviously in that situation the first step was to explain to them what was happening and that's how we got involved in november 4th these negotiations were going on and we stayed there until we found out they had reached a settlement a signed agreement there'd be no retaliation that people they, they were gonna they were gonna look get into the funding of the elp they were gonna set up a process where that would take place initially on november 4th there were no arrests made because Part of the, the list, the demands that the president signed was an agreement that none of the students would be charged with any kinds of criminal activity resulting out of this. So then we were, uh, the students were allowed to leave the administration building. But immediately upon doing so, the president recanted and said that the only reason he signed these things was, uh, he was because of duress. And lo and behold, the next day, Felony warrants were put out for every black student that was involved, including some that weren't even there because just they happened to be that they were black. The police occupied this campus for a week after this event, and they had a, a fistful of John Doe warrants for arrest of black students, which had no names on them. And all of the SDS people and the people from the Hillel Council and other people who were there, it wasn't just SDS who were basically uh, white students, uh, uh, they were also uh, going to be arrested. And from then on, we had a state of siege around here in some respects. They had uh, a great many um, um, police and FBI and um, uh, coming into our classes with guns and with walkie-talkies, and we weren't sure what was being recorded and what wasn't being recorded and where it was going. What the black students had to do on the eve of November 4th and for the next three or four days, we had to leave the campus entirely and hide out in various churches in Pacoima and in Los Angeles while we tried to work out a way in which we could uh, uh, deal with this thing legally. What ends up happening as a result of this, uh, a number of uh, several of the uh, black LAPDs who work for the Human Relations Department Act as a, acted as a go-between and met with us in the churches, convinced us that if all of the students would turn themselves in simultaneously, that they would not be beaten, brutalized, harassed, etc. So all of the students who had received these John Doe warrants then turned themselves in 
at the Van Nuys Police Department in mass. Because the students involved in the so-called takeover of the administration building had been arrested and were in jail, a number of faculty members, including myself, had organized a bail bond committee. I was uh, part of a group that uh, tried to uh, get our students out on bail and assist them with uh, legal advice. I helped raise funds uh, from faculty and from interested community uh, people to uh, bail students out. That period of time, I can remember in the morning, getting up in the morning and feeling as though I was going off to fight evil. Um, that it was a clear distinction of what was right and what was wrong. Quite a few white students had come to the point of understanding what our cause was, what it meant, and that we did not want to take over the university, did not want to take over the country, we wanted in. educated the students on this campus. We stayed up all night printing leaflets so that seven o'clock in the morning the next day we had maps of the campus. We knew which entrance of the campus had how many students at how much time, when was the best time to leaflet, and we hit this campus. And every student on this campus knew what was going on every day. There was an organization uh, we call ourselves at that time the November 4th Committee, but they basically consisted of uh, a number of students that were opposed to the, uh, the racism and the discrimination on the campus. And uh, we continued to work uh, together with uh, other groups on the campus that were progressive-minded. As the fall semester continued, uh, frustration started to build up again because of the lack of progress and uh, the difficulties in making any kind of headway with uh, the administration at that particular time. By January 8th, on that particular day, a great number of students had gathered at the open forum. We had proposed to march from the free speech area up to the administration building. And then at the administration building, there would be a series of small speeches, and then uh, the leadership would go in and attempt to meet with the powers that be. There were about 2,000 to 3,000 people uh, who marched from this open forum area to the administration building to lay our demands again upon the administration. We weren't going there to sit in or anything. We marched to the building. It became almost a ritual through the year before to come up here, shout at the administration, you know, let us in, uh, you know, support the, the ten demands, et cetera, et cetera, almost ritualistic. Except on this day, things had changed because there were community people there as well. The outside world was there. We're in front of the administration building. About three or four of us spoke. We attempt to enter the administration building, and the door is locked. So we make a couple more speeches, and then we say that just the leadership is going to go in. When we opened that door, when I opened that door, it was wall-to-wall -wall police. We didn't even know that they were on campus. They had parked a bus in the back of the administration building, and the police were waiting. As soon as we stepped in, they grabbed us and began to beat us with the uh, batons.
And then they immediately slammed the door shut, and I was holding the door. Meanwhile, people walking in and seeing the beatings immediately realized they were next. So they tried to come out, and I'm tugging on the door, and the police are tugging on the inside of the door. But I remember it stopped hurting. You know, they just couldn't hurt me anymore. I was just so angry, and then I blacked out for a little bit. And somebody down the line, whether it was one of our people or whether it was a police agent, we don't know, but they pitched an ashtray through a window, and the glass broke. Well, that was like a trigger, and the police just came charging out of the administration building, club swinging. I'm number one in the line. I'm figuring I'm going to get my butt kicked. And they charged past me. Uh, you know, they looked at my blue eyes, and they charged right past me and were beating up black students who were 20, 30 feet behind me. Then they realized, you know, they knew who the leadership was, and they realized, you know, that there were a few of us close in, so they started closing on us. Well, we, you know, hightailed it through the crowd, but luckily racism operated to our advantage. They bought us about 10 seconds while they were beating the hell out of some of the black students. And then everyone dispersed and this place looked, cops were chasing people. It was, it was unbelievable. One of the students, I'll never forget it, all of us are, are shackled on this bus. And this one student, his name was Sheldon, Apparently, one of the police had taken a baton, and I saw it in film in court later. He, his head was down on the ground, and this police, it was two of them. One of the policemen took his bat baton straight down and jammed it in his eye. And this young man's eye, uh, we thought he was losing it. It was, and they wouldn't give him any medical treatment none of us and we're bleeding and i could hear you could hear these guys enjoying what they were doing there was no question about what's your intent why you're doing what you're doing uh, it was about i want to inflict pain on your black ass and they had their day, and they did it. And they did this in front of all of these folks who were there nonviolently. And some of them came just for curiosity's sake. Well, the next day, we had scores of people wanting to join what we were doing. We met that night, and the faculty, meanwhile, met that night and was saying, what's happening to our campus, basically? And big, big name faculty by that time, not just, you know, faculty were sympathetic to us, saying, basically, the campus is breaking down over this issue and it's got to be dealt with. The administration responds, zilch. The faculty members say to the administration, wait a minute, you know, if we don't stop this, there's going to be bloodshed on the campus, meaning the police are going to kill somebody. It, was, it, it had become so bad by that time, that the, uh, and, and, the, and the potential for violence, uh, everyone felt, uh, was, was so great, or that, that things were coming to some kind of head. Uh, that, that night, I believe it was the night of uh, January 8th, uh, a, a big meeting was held at a church in Pacoima of, uh, uh, of everyone, all the blacks and those who were in support of them to sort of chart what could be done and what should be done. Uh, we had reserved the free speech area for the following morning, January 9th, for another, for a meeting. On January 9th, when I came to campus, I already knew, probably leaving home, that it was going to be a day that uh, would, would live in my mind for a long time. It, things were tense. You didn't know what was going to happen. So we came onto the campus and expected to hold a very peaceful rally because we did not want a continuation of the bloodshed from the day before and the police beating up on us. We were the ones getting hurt. We had decided the night before that if there was any police action, we were not going to take a confrontative approach, that we were a nonviolent 
movement, that we wanted to make the issues clear. That morning, before we even got, got to campus, the administration had declared a state of emergency on the campus that, um, and declared that nobody could, there, there could be no assembly on campus. But by after, after this bloodletting the day before, the students on the campus, there was no functioning classes anymore. The students at 8 o'clock in the morning were already in the free speech area were just wondering what was going to happen. So we went into the, into the cafeteria, and we brought out chairs, and we lined them up in the free speech area. So there was probably two, three hundred chairs there, and where it would have been really impossible to, to move around and, and, you know, fight the police. We could see to the distance off to our right where there is a, a large lawn area next to the music building, uh, numerous trucks, uh, police vehicles, cars, trucks, um, buses, I mean, it looked like an army. By the time the police came out, there was probably three or 4,000 people out there. The entire, by 9, 30, 10 o'clock, which is the height of the student, you know, presence on the campus, everybody wants to know what's going on. Some sympathetic, some curious. The announcement was made through the, by the police. They identified themselves that they were here on campus and they were announcing that it was prohibited on that day to have that rally. I remember the, the, I remember the announcement. It was that, that sort of disembodied voice coming through a megaphone saying that we had two minutes to disperse. Uh, um, and that if we, didn't, if we didn't, we would all be arrested. Well, the announcement was made. Um, we refused to disperse. The police moved in. Then they came into the crowd and they knew who the leadership was. They had a list and they just went, get that guy, get that guy, get that guy, you know, and they proceeded to yank all of us. I was speaking on the stage. They yanked me down, took me away. Because they arrested some of the leaders. There was no one up there at the microphone, so some of us would, would go and replace those who were arrested, knowing that we were probably going to be arrested as well. And we didn't get to say too many words, and uh, we were arrested and uh, escorted to the buses, the police vehicles. Every time they'd yank one of the SDS or BSU people out of the audience, somebody from the surrounding crowd came and sat down. So the crowd never shrunk. And rather than being intimidated, it just grew. And pretty soon, people were standing up to the microphone who weren't even political, you know, weren't active, and saying, this is outrageous. You know, this is fascism. They're pulling, by then it's 100, 110, 120 arrests. Student government people were standing up, being arrested. Sundial staff people were being arrested. Freshman students who, you know, were outraged and didn't know what, even politically, what the history was of the campus, they were being arrested. The big buses were there to cart us down to the Van Nuys Jail. And uh, we were all taken in and booked. We were all, before we were booked, we were all thrown into a huge holding tank. And, we, and that turned into really a, a, a sort of magnificent uh, teach-in uh, as we all talked about what was happening and why it was happening and how such things could happen and so on. And then we were uh, individually booked and put into cells. And um, that's the first and only time I've been in jail. And I remember walking in front of the window like a caged animal, thinking to myself, oh my God, I am never going to see another woman again. <laughs> so it was, a, it was one of the most peaceful mass arrests in the history of probably the college movement. Uh, but at the same time, it broke the administration's back because they didn't know what to do. They, they couldn't respond to this. This was solidarity. This was students being arrested. They thought they could behead it. And rather than beheading it and killing the monster, it sprang two new heads and created an instantaneous new generation of leaders. And finally, the administration acquiesced and gave in on all of our demands. The only demand they didn't give on was amnesty, but we had decided that at this point it was more important to win these programs that still exist at this campus, one of the few places that still have its EOP programs and, uh, and, and studies programs, special studies programs, still exist. We decided that was more important and we accepted the settlement even without the amnesty. Those actions, demonstrations that took place were forced on us because there were no other channels to use to address our grievances.